time is 11 o'clock. This morning's short story, The Journey Back, is written by Rosemary Davis and read by Derek Guiler. He managed to slip out without being seen. Fighting an impulse to run, he hurried through the shopping crowds that thronged the street. It was only a few hundred yards to Central Station, and as he turned into the courtyard, he glanced at his watch. Two o'clock. The first train that came in would do, wherever it was going. He ran down the steps leading to the Birkenhead, New Brighton and Hoylake line, and bought a ticket for Hoylake. As he presented it at the barrier, a train came in. Next one in for High Lake. Where's this one going? Uh, New Brighton. That'll do. Well, you want the next one. It doesn't matter. He tore down the stairs two at a time, jumped into the train, and sat down with a sigh of relief. The carriage was hot and fairly crowded. Women with sweaty faces and limp summer dresses on their way home from a shopping spree at the sales, sat clutching the bargains that constantly threatened to slide off their laps. The children were hot, sticky and tired. Two sunburn girls, two Merseyside Bridget Bardos, giggled together in a corner. The young man next to him carried a rolled up bathing towel. The train rattled through the dark tunnel, stopping at the old familiar places, St James's, Birkenhead. It was years since he'd travelled that way, and yet it seemed such a little time ago. He remembered the family outings, the once-a-year days that his mother had scraped and saved to give them. Life had been an unceasing struggle in the 1930s, with the shipyards closed and his father out of work, and yet she'd managed somehow to give them all one day's holiday every year at New Brighton, or, if there was enough money for the extra fare, Hoylake. Ma'am had liked Hoylake because it was quiet and more refined. They were the golden days, anticipated with passionate longing for weeks before the event, remembered and treasured for months afterwards. The train emerged from the tunnel and clattered through the neat suburbs. There were more houses than he remembered. Well, probably a lot had been built since the war. The people in the train appeared different too, prosperous well-dressed and well-fed. The train reached New Brighton, and he left the station by the narrow passage near the gents, just because he and Dad always used to go that way to tease Ma'am and his sister Mary. He went down the road past the cinema, now closed, whose faded posters still advertised an amateur operatic performance of Oklahoma that had taken place five months before. And there, before him, glittering and sparkling, was the sea. Well, the Mersey, really, but at this point the river was very wide, and if you looked westward it was the open sea all right, the Irish Channel, with the wide Atlantic beyond. The gateway to America, Dad said. His father always dreamed of going there one day, and sometimes he'd talk about it with a wistful look in his eyes. It's a land of opportunity, land. Oh, you can, you can make good money there. We could get a little house, you know, a little house of our own, with a proper kitchen for Mum, and a car, maybe, for going out on a Sunday. Dad never gave up hope of seeing America. But in the end, it was he himself who had gone, many times. There was a stiff breeze blowing. He'd forgotten that. There'd always been a, an astringent bite to the wind after the leaden atmosphere of the Liverpool back streets. He crossed the wide stretch of grass that ran along the front and went down the path beside the wall of the swimming pool. The wall sheltered him from the wind and it was like stepping suddenly into a sun trap. It would have been a good place for sunbathing, but there was nowhere to sit and he wanted to be down on the beach. Chains hung across the stone ramps leading down from the promenade and notices warned against the dangers of bathing when the tide was in. But the flat sands extended before him, and he could hardly see the small waves breaking on the shore. They were so far away. He ducked under the chain and went down the slope. A wide, shallow pool of seawater washed against its foot, and he had to take off his shoes to wade through it. The wet sand was cold under his bare feet, 
but he liked the feel of it. In front of him, and on either side, the broad, flat beach seemed to stretch for miles, shimmering away in the distance. There were few people about. Most of them liked to be near the pier, where they could buy ice creams and hire deck chairs. Ma'am had always liked it better here, and it hadn't mattered about the deck chairs and ices, because <laughs> they'd never been able to afford them. He walked parallel to the sea, making for the breakwater. The wind whipped against his face, but the sun was strong on his back and he was hot. He reached the breakwater and found a spot where he could sit leaning against one of the bollards, looking across the sands to the sea. He sat very still for a long time, lost in memories of Dad, Ma'am and his sister Mary, and the summers long ago. Suddenly, a woman's voice interrupted him. There was a family party some distance away, but the sound travelled clearly. Jimmy, if you'd only come out of that water and get your feet dried. It was Ma'am's voice all over again, almost the same words. Oh, if they'd only start up the shipyards again, you know. Uh, if your father could only get a job. If we could only, if we could only get your piano lessons. The wind was too cold to stay sitting for long, and presently he wandered down to the water's edge, carrying his shoes. Near the end of the breakwater, two boys were crouching over a little pool, peering into the water. He stopped to look too, but the pool seemed empty. One of the boys looked up and saw him. It's a crab, mister. There's a, a little one in there. It, it, but it's under that lump of wood. Oh, do you want to catch it? They had no jam jar or tin to put it in. No, no, no. The answer was a protest. No, we, we just wanted to have a look at it like, you know. It, it's only little, but we hadn't seen a large one before. Only we can't move that wood. It's too heavy. Well, I'll give you a hand. The driftwood was long and square, like a length of an old beam. They all took hold of it and heaved, drawing it slowly out of the grip of the sand. As it came away, the water in the pool swirled became cloudy, and then cleared again. There it is. I can see it, the smaller boy shouted. Oh, isn't it a lovely little thing? They all stared at the tiny creature moving in the shallow water. The bigger boy said, Here, why well, isn't it pink, mister? Like all the big ones in the fish shops. Well, they're all that colour when they're in the sea, he explained. They only go pink when they're cooked. The boys made no comment but squatted on their haunches, watching the crab entirely fascinated. He noticed a steamer with a red funnel moving slowly down the river to the sea. It looked like one of the boats that crossed to the Isle of Man. A coastal tug towing a string of barges was heading upriver to the docks. He thought the boys had forgotten him and began to walk away. But the elder one looked up again and said, Can you tell us the time, mister? He looked at his watch. Uh, yes, it's a quarter past three. Yeah, Harry, what time's our train? said the smaller boy. Ah, uh, we'll catch the five o'clock, it'd be all right, said Harry. It was as if he was trying to be reassuring. Are you from Liverpool? Yeah, said Harry. Is this your brother? Yeah, uh, he's our Johnny. Johnny transferred his attention from the crab to the conversation, listening and watching with a frown. Are you on holiday? Had his face flushed, and Johnny tugged at his coat, muttering, Don't tell him! Don't tell him! There was no need to tell him. Often he sat in his stuffy council school classroom on summer afternoons, staring out of the window and wishing he could slip away to the sea for a while. He'd never had enough money for the fare, but apparently these two had managed it. He grinned at them. It's all right, he said. I won't tell anybody. He picked up his shoes and tied them together by the laces. Well, goodbye, he said. I'm going for a walk. Can we come? said Johnny, picking up his shoes, whose laces were already firmly knotted together. He'd lost interest in the crab. Yes, if you like. They wandered along the shore, picking up shells and bits of wood washed up by the tide, examining them, speculating about how they got there, and then flinging them back into the water. They were nearing the more popular end of the beach, 
where fathers with rolled up trouser legs paddled carefully with small children while their wives sat knitting in deck chairs. How about tea? He asked the boys. Well, said Harry, I don't know. I'm hungry, said Johnny. On me, he said, with ices. Oh, yes, please, said Johnny. Ah, yes, well, uh, thanks, said Harry. Uh, we weren't going to have tea, really, like, you know. We hadn't enough money, said Johnny brightly. But it's all right if you're paying. Johnny, shut up. His brother gave him a shove, and they walked on. Here, yeah, said Johnny suddenly. We haven't got anything to try our feet on. I, I hate sand between me toes, you know. I'll show you where you can get them dry. He led them across the beach towards a high wall jutting out into the river. There were rocks at the foot of it with pools of water between them, sheltered from the wind and warm by the sun. They washed their feet in one of them and basked on the rocks until they were satisfied that they were really dry. Then he took them to a small cafe on the promenade where conversation lagged until the boys had eaten their way through a mountain of sandwiches, two cream buns each, chocolate biscuits and ice cream. When they'd finished, he said goodbye to them on the pavement and walked along the promenade towards the station. All the way back in the train, he could feel his face glowing from the wind and the sun, and he felt soothed and contented. He had taken a journey into the past and found that out of all that had happened, it was only the happy things that had left their mark on his memory. Men from the dockyards crowded into the train, dressed as his father used to be in grimy working clothes, their faces dark with sweat and dirt. He would have liked to talk with them, but they would have nothing to say to him now. He was too far removed from their way of life. He reached Liverpool just before five o'clock and hurried up the street to one of the city's famous hotels. As he entered the foyer, the commissioner, the clerk at the reception desk, the two pages and the head waiter all bowed respectfully and murmured, Good evening, sir. The lift swept him up to his suite on the second floor. He opened the door and his wife looked up from a pile of letters she held in her hand. Darling, where on earth have you been? He smiled at her. She looked very lovely in the new black dress they had bought in Paris last week. If only a man could have had a dress like that, occasionally. Darling, she repeated, I said, where on earth have you... Oh, I just went out, he said lightly. Got to hurry now, though. Get me a drink like a good girl, will you? And order us something to eat. Up here. He kicked off his shoes and hung his jacket on the back of a chair. His wife busy at the drinks table, knew better than to expect an explanation straight away. She said, the phone's been going all afternoon, and there are all these letters to be answered. The manager of the Philharmonic rang, he's sending his car for you at six, and there's a press conference at 6.15. I said that you'd give them about half an hour. That leaves you 45 minutes before the concert, and he's asked us back to supper at his house afterwards, and I said we'd go if you weren't too tired. Are you? She looked at him anxiously. Never felt better in my life. I'm just going to have a shower. Carrying his drink in his hand, the distinguished conductor strode into the bathroom. His wife, picking up his shoes to put them away, paused and stared thoughtfully at the floor. On the carpet was a little trickle of sand. That story, The Journey Back, was written by Rosemary Davis, and the reader was Derek Geiler.